Hello, and welcome to part 5 of the Gospel-Based Parenting video series. If you've not done so already, I would highly encourage you to go back and check out part 1, the introduction, part 2, what does the Bible say about spanking, part 3, what is the biblical rod, part 4, how should we interpret the book of Proverbs, and today we will be answering the question, who is the child mentioned in the book of Proverbs? Did you know that the entire argument for spanking rests on just four short verses, all of which are found in the book of Proverbs? Let's take a look at them. These are the four spanking verses that Christians use most often to defend the practice of hitting children. Proverbs 13, 24 states, He who withholds his rod hates his son but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Proverbs 22.15 says, Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs 23.13 and 14 says, Do not withhold discipline from the child. Although you strike him with the rod, he will not die. You will strike him with the rod and rescue his soul from Sheol. And last but not least, Proverbs 29, 15 says the rod and reproof give wisdom, but a child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. That's it. These four verses have formed the basis for a parenting philosophy that has lasted for centuries. And ironically enough, it was by studying these four verses in depth that I came to the conclusion that there's absolutely no biblical basis for hitting my child. And I hope that by the end of this video, you will be able to say the same thing. You see, the key to understanding these passages rests on an accurate understanding of the word translated as child. But before I explain what the word in Hebrew really means, I want us to explore a brief scenario in English that will help us to understand a little better. Imagine for a moment that you are visiting a friend who has two sons, a toddler and a teenager. And let's pretend that you asked your friend, Hey, is your child still wearing diapers? Even though she has two children, she would easily understand that you were asking a question about her toddler and not her teenager. The context of the conversation gives crucial clues to accurately understand what is being communicated. Likewise, if you were to ask your friend, Hey, can your son move my car? She wouldn't hand the keys to her two-year-old. Even though both children are her sons, the context of the question provides the clarity of the message. The same is true in the passages about the child in Proverbs. We can easily understand an ambiguous term like child by looking at the context around the word. And as we discussed in part four, the context of the book of Proverbs is about adult men, not toddlers. Now let's take a look at another example. Let's imagine that you are the one with two children a toddler and a teenager, and your friend asks you what each of your children would like to drink for lunch. So you say, oh, my toddler will drink juice, and my teenager prefers soda. Your friend will not be confused about who gets juice and who gets soda, because the word toddler and teenager are not ambiguous terms. Those terms have specific meaning, connotations that people who are familiar with English would readily understand. We understand that while both of the boys can be called a child and both can be called a son, only one is a toddler and only one is a teenager. So it's easy to understand that this one will get the juice and this one will get the soda. In English, we have a lot of different ways to describe children in different stages of development. For example, newborn, infant, toddler, Elementary age, preteen, teenager. These are all different words that we use to describe children. A newborn is always a child, but a child is not always a newborn. An infant is always a child, but a child is not always an infant. A toddler is always a child, but a child is not always a toddler, and so on. So while we use all these different terms to describe children in different stages of development, the Hebrew language actually does the same thing. 
This is a chart that I got from Samuel Martin's book, Thy Rod and Thy Staff, They Comfort Me. His book was instrumental for me as I was starting to research. You can order a copy of his book from Amazon, or you can download a free PDF from his website, which I'll post in the description. One of the things that I love about Jewish culture is that they really care about the meaning of words. This is why we see so often in scripture that people were careful to name their children because of the meaning of their name, not simply because they liked it. So as we can see from this chart, the stages of child development in Hebrew are strongly connected to the meaning of the root words. So for example, the word yaled comes from the meaning to give birth. So this would be the English equivalent of a newborn, someone ranging from the ages of zero to one month. The word yanek comes from the root word meaning to suck or to nurse. So this would be like the English equivalent of an infant, usually around the ages from one to 12 months. This is a young breastfeeding baby. The word olel comes from the root word meaning to ask for bread. So this is a child that's still breastfeeding but is starting to eat solid foods, somewhere between the ages of one and three years old. Gamol means to wean or to complete. So this would be an older toddler, one that's starting to wean off of breastfeeding, usually around the ages of three to four years old. The word taf is the root word, it comes from the root word meaning to cling. So this would be an older child that's still clinging to their mother. Elem means to become firm. And this would be about the age of a preteen, ranging from seven to 11 years old. Also, we have the word nar, which means to shake off. And the English equivalent of this word would be a teenager. But in this context, uh, the word na'ar is typically someone between the ages of 12 and 18 years old, which as we mentioned in a previous video, that would be someone who is technically considered a legal adult. So they technically wouldn't really be a child anymore. The word bakhur means ripened one. So this is someone who's ready to get married. And last but not least, ish. This is uh, just a generic term meaning man. Most Christians who believe in spanking and advocate for hitting a child are typically advocating for hitting a child somewhere in this range here, between the ages of one and six. So somewhere between yanek and taf. Now let's see if we can get a better understanding of which Hebrew word is being used in the four spanking passages. The first verse that we mentioned was Proverbs 13, 24, which states, He who withholds his rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. So the person supposedly being spanked here is the Hebrew word ben, which if you can remember, that was not on our chart because the word ben simply means son. It does not have any further connotations regarding the person's age or development. So this could be any person ranging from the ages of one to 100. Since this is the more general term, we wanna look for the more specific term in order to understand these passages. So let's take a look at the other three verses and see if we can get a better clue. We already talked about Proverbs 13, 24, which uses the generic word son, but you'll notice that the other three verses all contain a word that was translated as child. And that Hebrew word, was the Hebrew word na'ar. Now, if you remember from our chart, na'ar is right here, at the very bottom of our chart. Na'ar is the word that is used in all three of those other spanking passages. And this refers to someone who is 12 to 18 years old. Now, because I tend to question everything, I decided to continue researching this word from a variety of different scholarly sources, including a close friend of mine who happened to be a Hebrew teacher for a Jewish school. I needed to know for myself what this word really meant, so I took a screenshot of this word from my concordance and I showed it to her without providing any context at all. Can you tell me what this word means? She looked at it and said, why yes, that's the Hebrew word na'ar. I asked her, what does this word mean? And she replied, Anad is a boy that is like 17, not really a little boy, but not really mature like a man either. Just to be sure, I asked her to clarify. So is my daughter Sophia Anad? To which she laughed and said, no. So I motioned towards her eight-year-old son and asked again, is your son Anad? 
And again, she replied, no. Anad is like 15 or 16 or 17 years old. My son is not Anad yet. And to this day, whenever I encounter a Hebrew speaker or a Hebrew scholar, I will often ask them what this word means, and they will always tell me the same thing. If Christians today knew and understood the meaning of this one crucial word in Hebrew, the case for spanking our little ones would certainly be closed, as I hope that it is for you. And this concludes part five of the Gospel-Based Parenting video series. If you've not done so already, I highly encourage you to go back and check out part one, the introduction, part two, what does the Bible say about spanking, part three, what is the biblical rod, part four, how should we interpret the Proverbs, and today we answer the question, who is the child that is mentioned in Proverbs? This was the one word that completely destroyed the argument for spanking for me. And at this point in my journey, I had become convinced that there was absolutely no biblical basis for me to hit my one-year-old daughter. But I could not deny all the passages that talk about discipline. So this led me to my next question. What really is biblical discipline? Check out part six in order to find the answer to this crucial question. As I mentioned before, this video series is based on my book, Gospel-Based Parenting, which is available for purchase on Amazon.com. You can also download a free copy of my book from my website, www.peacefulworldschoolers.com. Every chapter includes a list of reflection and application questions that are meant to inspire discussions between you and your spouse, your small group, or even your church. These discussions are so important and will help you to reflect on your own personal experiences, analyze your own biases or preconceived ideas, and apply biblical truths in a way that will transform your family as you live out the gospel of Jesus Christ. And if you have enjoyed this series so far, please like this video and subscribe to my YouTube channel so that you'll be able to continue to receive updates on my latest video.